Welcome to service. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, yeah. It's a good day to be here. <laughs> this week I was at a pastor's meeting, and anyway, th this pastor gave an illustration about the Titanic. Y'all know about the Titanic. It sunk, right? The thing that a lot of people... Well, yeah. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Sorry. If you're going to see the movie, it goes down, okay? It's just, you know, I hope you know that in history already. I mean, you know, if you don't, and you go to see the movie Titanic or rent it, it's a tragedy, just saying. But one of the things about that that was even more of a tragedy was that they had lifeboats. They didn't have enough for everybody on the ship, which is a tragedy in itself. But... Most of the lifeboats went away less than half full. Right? They could have saved a lot more people if they filled up the lifeboats. But they left. They, they interviewed the people after, after this tragedy happened, the people that survived, especially the ones in the boat. And they said something to them. They said, why didn't you go back to pick up the people that were just in the water? Right? I mean, you could... Just turn that boat around, paddle it back, and pick people up. Why didn't you? And the answer was this. They were afraid if they went back, those people would tip the boat over, and they would die too. Now that's a real, I mean, I don't want to die, and you've got safety. But I want you to picture this. You're in the lifeboat, and you're hearing people call for help that you know are going to die, and you just paddle away. We, we look at that and we go, how could they ever do that, right? I, I mean, kind of we understand. Let's be honest. We kind of understand. But what would you do if you were in the boat? Would you go back to save people and risk yourself, risk your comfort, risk your safety? In the same way, today, you're in a lifeboat that has salvation and eternal life. And there's people outside this lifeboat that need you to come back for them. And sometimes we don't go back for them because we don't want to rock the boat in our church. We like how church is. We like our friends. We like who we sit with. We like the people around us. We like the band. We don't want to mess it up. So instead of turning back and going for more people, we don't want to rock our boat. So we turn away from people. You know, I pray that I'm not a pastor that, come, that, that values comfort over Christ that values comfort over winning others telling others I hope for people that realize that everybody's eternity is valuable to God and today we're going to continue our series on being committed committed are we committed to commitment last week we talked about commitment and we said commitment was three things commitment was deciding on a direction Right? You have to decide to be committed to something. You have to decide what you want to do, what you want to be committed to. So first you have to decide the direction. Then you have to do what you say. You know, you, I'm going to be committed to this. Then you have to do it. You have to do what you say. And thirdly, it's never giving up. Okay, those are commitment. Deciding on direction, doing what you say, and never giving up. Right? That would be our definition of commitment and being committed. You know, commitment, it's not easy, is it? Being committed to things, it's not easy. It, it takes, well, commitment. There's no other word that we can use to substitute for commitment because it is the essential word, the, the quintessential word that defines and says what it is. Right? You, you know, we give these three definitions, but it can only be summed up in the word commitment. In our world, we're not committed to many things, are we? I think the only thing that most people are committed to is themselves. They're committed to pleasing me. But when we really put commitment, it means we strive for commitment daily. It means we persevere through difficult circumstances and never give up and keep doing it. That is why so few, so few people are committed. But that's now not how God wants us to live our lives. Can I tell you, I think I can clearly illustrate, I think I'm going to this morning, that God wants commitment in our lives. He wants us to be committed. Today, we're going to be talking about how uh, we're going to spend our time this morning talking about if we're being committed to God or not. Are we really committed to God, to following Him? If you want to be a good follower of God, you need to be committed to Him. Listen to what Vince Lombardi said. Vince Lombardi said this, 
the quality of a person's life is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence, regardless of their chosen endeavor. Let me read it again. So you kind of, I want you to kind of think on this for a second. The quality of a person's life is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence, regardless of their chosen endeavor. Now, Vince Lombardi was a football coach. What he's saying is, if you want, if you uh, want, if you want a quality football career, you have to be committed to it, committed to doing whatever it takes to excellence. But he says it doesn't matter what area of life you're in. If you endeavor to be a great follower of Jesus then the quality of your life is going to be in direct proportion to your commitment to Him. You catch me? If we want to be a God follower, Christ follower, then the quality of our life is in direct proportion to our commitment to Him. How much are you committed to God? That's going to determine what kind of Christ follower, God follower you are. What's your commitment? You see, as I've looked at these quotes, you know it's really hard and harsh in my mind? You know where I get most of my quotes about commitment? I mean, I get them on the internet. Everybody knows where I get them. But do you know who I get them from? An older generation. Because today's generation is not committed to commitment. We don't want to be committed to anything. So I have to go to a former generation to find quotes about being committed. Is that not sad? Is that not scary? about our world not being committed? So the question is, how do we commit our lives to God? Okay, Pastor Carl, I want to be committed to God, but how do I do it? Um, that is the most important question. So I want to look through three ways that Jesus asks us to commit our lives to Him. If you've got your Bible, Matthew chapter 22. Listen, we're going to be mostly in Matthew today. So, you, you know, if you find one, you're going to be able to find them all pretty quick, okay? So Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. A guy comes up to Jesus and he says, hey, what, uh, what does it take? What's the greatest commandment? What's the most important thing I can do? And verse 37 is the beginning of his answer. We won't read his whole answer. But verse 37 is the answer. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Does this not sound like a verse on commitment? I mean, is this not Jesus saying, here's what I want. I want commitment. That commitment includes your heart, your mind, and your soul. So I want to look at those three things. I want to define what this commitment that Jesus was asking for was. So if you got your outline, number one, commit your heart to God. If Jesus is telling us the most important thing we can do is commit our heart to God, number one. What's the description of our heart? Our heart is what directs our actions. Okay. Now, a lot of people think my mind directs my actions, but that's not true. Your mind gives your heart all the choices and all the options and, and gives it the consequence stuff like that, but your heart chooses. Right? Let me ask it to you this way. Have you ever decided you're going to go visit a family member? Maybe when you were engaged to your spouse, you say, I'm going to drive all night to see him for one day, then drive back all day. Right? Was that your mind saying this is a good idea? <laughs> No, it was your heart going, oh, I just want to be with them, right? You made a decision based on your heart, not your mind. How many of y'all made a decision and go, this is dumb, right? In the middle of doing it, you're like, this is not smart. What made the decision? Your heart. Your heart overruled your logic and made decisions. And I'm telling you, that's where our decisions are made. Look at Matthew chapter 15. Just a few verse, uh, uh, pages earlier. Matthew 15, 18. The, in the beginning of this chapter, the Pharisees come and they accuse the apostles of sinning and, and being sinful, doing things wrong, because they weren't washing their hands before they ate. Now, moms, I know what you're going to say. Yes, you should wash your hands. And I agree, you should wash your hands before you eat. But we're talking about sin or not here, okay? Jesus answered verse 18 and says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And they defile a man, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. It doesn't cause us to be sinful. Listen, what Jesus is fighting here is these Pharisees making up rules and saying, you've got to do this, and if you don't do it, you're sinning. 
And Jesus is trying to tell them, it's not about your actions, because where do your actions come from? Your heart. You see, we decide something, and then we speak it or say it or do it. You get what I'm saying? We, we decide something in our heart, and then our actions follow. But where does it start? Our heart. That's what Jesus said. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the, what does it say? The heart. Our actions start in our heart, come out of our mouth, come out of our body. The Bible says here that the things that come out of our mouth start in your heart. That's what the Bible is teaching us, right? The Pharisees had come and said, listen, their actions are wrong. But listen, in God's word in Samuel, there, there was a statement that we always quote, but I don't think we really completely understand. And the verse says this, man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on your heart. Okay? People judge you by what you do, but they cannot see your heart. Only God can look on your heart. And what he's telling the Pharisees is, listen, you're only judging a person by the outward actions. You can't see their heart. But their heart is where, verse 19, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts and all these sins he quotes. Listen, our sin starts in our heart. Listen, it's not about controlling our actions because if we control our actions, we can still sin. Let me illustrate that. Don't, you don't have to turn there. They'll put it on the screen. But Matthew 5, 28. Matthew 5, 28 says this. Jesus speaking says, But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with, with her in his... Did the actions happen in this verse? But the sin did. Why? It's about the heart. What, what Jesus is trying to teach them here in Matthew 15... Is it's not about controlling our actions. It's about controlling our heart before our actions. You get what I'm saying? Like, sin, we see the sin in our actions, and that is sin. I'm not saying it's not. But that is sin. But where did the sin start? You first sinned in your heart. Can I tell you this morning, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, the first place salvation begins is in your heart. You hear it, you know it, you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And you go, that's the truth. Now, can I tell you something? Your actions do need to match your heart. God's not saying it's okay to, 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 to do things wrong with our body as long as our heart's right. That's not what he's saying. He's saying get your heart right and your actions will follow. Yeah. Get your heart right with God and, and you won't want to sin. Listen, man, when I sin, I feel bad. I don't like the feeling of sin. I mean, we like the action, but then... I don't like the consequences. I don't like how it separates me from God. I don't like how it separates me from people. We've got to get our hearts right. That's what Jesus is speaking to here. Getting our hearts right. It's our heart that we have to control. And if we control our heart, listen, our actions, what we says, what we say comes from our heart. Get our heart right first. And that will take care of itself. See, God knows faith commitment. You know, you can fool people. Man looks on the outward appearance. You can fool people. Same chapter. Look back in verse 8. Look back in verse 8. He's talking to the Pharisees. They come and they said, your, your guys, they're sinning. They're, they're defiled. They're evil because they don't wash their hands. Verse 8, Jesus says, these people draw near, speaking of the Pharisees, these people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. The Pharisees, their actions look like they're honoring God, but their heart is far from God. It's interesting. Jesus is quoting Isaiah 29, 13 here. Let me read you Isaiah 29, 13. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but they have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the commandments of men. Is that not a description of the Pharisees? They're making up these rules to control people. And they're saying, listen, if you want to be right with God, don't worry about your heart. Just do our, do our rules. Follow our rules. If you follow our rules, we'll guarantee you're right. And they couldn't. Because our actions don't necessarily determine our heart. Yes, our actions come out of our heart, but you can fake the outward, right? You can fake worship. Jesus knows where your heart is. And he knows when your heart's far from him. 
You can say words that sound good, but where's your heart this morning? This morning when we were singing and praising God in these songs, Jesus, Messiah, I was sitting there thinking, I wonder what a Jewish person would come in here singing songs to a Jewish man. Worshiping a Jewish man. I wonder what they would think. But we understand who Jesus was. It wasn't just this Jewish man. He was God. Where was your heart singing that? Listen, you can, and the band can get up here. You can be there, and you can look like you're worshiping. You can raise your hand, but it doesn't matter. It's where your heart is that matters. Where's your heart this morning? Have we given our heart to God? Not just our actions. We can fake our actions, our heart. Jesus was saying here, they say words that sound like they love me, but they haven't given me their heart. He's saying that about the Pharisees. What Jesus is telling us is that what normally comes from our mouth started in our heart. But these people are trying to fake their heart towards God. That's what he's saying about the Pharisees. They're trying to manipulate us because we think if we see the actions, that comes from their heart, which normally does. But you can fake that. And so he says this verse. And he says, they worship me with their mouth and with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They look like they love me, but they don't. Can I tell you, there are people in this world that look like they love Jesus, they look like they love God, and they don't. And they're faking actions. And as people, we can't tell. But God knows. Listen, you're here this morning, and I hope your heart was 100% worshiping God. But I'm going to tell you, sometimes I come in the morning, and I don't feel like worshiping. And there's times I'm having one of those days. I need to get down on my knees and we need to get down on our knees. I don't care if it's right now. When you say, God, I want to give you my heart. I want to quit faking my worship to you. I want to quit faking my daily life for you. I want to give you my heart. See, you can't fake your heart toward God because He knows. You might fool us, but you can't fool God. He knows what's going on. See, God wants your heart. You're, if you go to Matthew chapter 6, just a few pages before that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. God, He wants you to give Him your heart. And, and He understands what this is. Look at Matthew 16, 19 through 21. We read these verses a lot, but I want you to read the verse, but I want you to focus on those last verse. It says, do not let for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now concentrate on verse 21 with me. For where your treasure is, there your... What's that word? Heart will be also. Later, Jesus, you know, is talking about our heart. Chapter 22. He said, I want you to give me my whole heart. And we keep finding this throughout Matthew, especially throughout the Bible. He's talking about our heart. And here he says, let your treasures in heaven where moth doesn't. Remember back then, clothing was a very important thing. And moths would, would eat their clothing. And they didn't, moths were a big problem back in the Bible time. We go, what's the big deal about moths? Right? Well, it was a big deal then. It was their riches. It was their possessions. Don't lay up treasures in your possessions. Where moths of it, where thieves break in and steal. Well, we will we deal with that today. It's cyber criminals, right? Just as bad as real criminals. They can take what we have. Right? We don't want people to say, but listen, if we're if we're storing up treasure on earth and money, it can be stolen. And rust destroys our things. Right? Man, we're we're bad about things in America, aren't we? Our cars. Rust. Takes where a thing. Man, God's saying, what you value, He's saying, what you, your, your possessions, He's saying, listen, you're valuing things on earth that can be destroyed. I want you to lay up treasure in heaven. And the reason I want you to do that is because I want your heart to be in the right place. That's what verse 21 says, because I want your heart to be on the right place. Here's the question Where do you store your treasures? I want you to think this morning just for a second. What's the most important thing in your life right now? What is the most important thing you can think of? If I say, hey, what do you treasure more than anything else in your life? What do you think of? 
you think of something physical, house, car, you think of something temporary, fame is very temporary, fortune is very temporary, or do you think of people? I value my husband, my, my, my kids, my, my grandkids. I, I value these things. Well, those things are eternal. And that's important. And that's a good thing. But can I tell you what should be number one? What's the most eternal thing in your life? Is your relationship with God. Is, is He where your heart lies? Is He what you put all your effort to? Because that's what Jesus is talking about here. The treasure you store. If you thought of something physical, that's a temporary treasure. Man, we might get 80 years here on earth. Maybe some of y'all would be lucky. I heard I talked to somebody the other day. Their grandmother died at 112 recently. I'm like, wow, dude, that's I mean, that's like that's an old, that's a long life. <laughs> now, how long is eternity? How long is eternity compared to 112 years? Like eternity, forever. See, we're getting conditioned on this earth to value temporary, and God's saying you need to value eternal. And that's all determined by our heart. Where's our heart? Do you value people the highest? That's what's in heaven. People are in heaven. You value God. He's what's in heaven. The people that you have won to Christ, is that what your treasure is? I won this person to Christ. And, and, and and every year I celebrate winning that person. Or this person I brought to church and, and now they've started a relationship with God. I value that. Are those the things that you treasure? That you change people's eternity? Or do you value the temper? Because I can tell you where your heart is. And you tell me what you love most. God wants you to commit your heart to heavenly things. He wants you to commit what you spend your life on to heavenly things. Seeing people one to Christ. Restoring people's relationship with God. Those are the things God wants you to commit your life to. His work. Too many times we're not. Go, go back to Matthew 22, 37. What's the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord God with all your heart. He's here talking to his people. He says, listen. I need you to give me your heart. But number two, what's the next one? And with all your soul. With your soul. You got your outline number two? Commit your soul to God. We're talking about commit, being committed to God. The second thing you've got to commit is your soul to God. Now, this is a different one. What's the soul? The soul is the eternal part of you. I want you to change your thinking in this. Okay? I want you to change your thinking for a second. So many times we think I'm a 6'2 fat dude that's 45 years old. Right? That's how we think who we are. Right? But that's not who you are. That's what your soul lives in. God created you as a soul and covered it in a body. Your soul is going to spend eternity somewhere. Now, I do believe in a bodily resurrection, but it's not going to be this body. Okay, I'll probably look the same, but maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll look better. Y'all can pray for that. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to have a body in heaven. I do believe that, but it's, it's a new body. It's more like what God has rather than this. This is a temporary body. We think of ourselves as this, but God says, you're a soul. And I want you to commit your soul to me, who you really are, the eternal part of you. He wants you to commit the eternal part of you. See, that's the only eternal part there is to you. Your soul. Your soul is going to spend eternity in heaven or hell. <coughs> so many times we spend our life building and maintaining the physical body, right? But how much time do we spend building our spiritual side, our soul? I want you to think of all the time you spend eating. Okay, enough said. But I'll go on. All the time you spend showering, working out. All those things to take care of our body, right? We do a lot of things. We eat, we work out, we, we, you know, whatever, go to doctor's appointments and all that kind of stuff. Take that time in your life. Now, I want you to compare it to the time you, sp you spend praying, reading God's Word, and coming to church. Does it even compare? We eat two to three times a day. 
we spend 30 minutes at each one of those mills, a very minimum hour of day eating. Could we agree on that? So seven hours a week, very minimum, very minimum, we spend eating. Have I just covered your whole spiritual life just for food? We spend so much time building this physical body and we ignore the eternal part of us. You know what God wants? He don't care about the physical. He don't care about washing your hands. I mean, He does care. The soul. Our soul needs as much work, if not more, than our body because it's the eternal part. It's what gonna, we're going to have for eternity. You see, He wants you to commit your life, your everything, your eternal part. You get what I'm saying? If your soul is the eternal part of you, then what does Jesus mean when he says you should love him with your soul? It means you should give him 100% of us. What the eternal part, the most important part, the one that's going to be around the longest. That's what he wants. He wants 100% of your eternity. Wow. You know, when we're talking about commitment, some people say, well, I could offer 50% commitment. Ever thought like that? Like, you know, Pastor, I can't, you know, but 50% commitment I can do. Uh, that doesn't work because you're forgetting our definition of commitment. Our definition of commitment is deciding on direction, doing what you say, and never giving up, right? How do you 50% decide on a direction? That means you haven't decided, right? You've got, still got two choices if it's 50-50. You haven't decided. Keep going. 50% of doing what you say is not doing what you say. But, 50% of the time, I'm going to do what I say. Within the other 50% of the time, you're not doing what you said. That's not a commitment. Think about it. 50% of the time, I'm never going to give up. Never's a long word for 50%, right? I'm never going to give up, except for 50% of the time. You know, it's like somebody comes to you and say, I love you, but they're about to cancel out everything they just said. But what's coming after that, right? I'm going to give you 50% commitment. No, you're not. That's an oxymoron. I'm not calling you a moron. <laughs> oxymoron is two words put together that mean opposite things. Let me give you an example. How about act naturally? <laughs> Are you supposed to act or be natural? You know, the teacher comes, your parents come, act naturally. Am I acting? Or am I going to, you know, like there's words that we say, we say we don't realize. What about bittersweet? Do you want bitter or sweet? Oh, it's a bittersweet moment. No, I just want the sweet moments. Thank you. You know, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't want bittersweet. I want sweet. There's other ones. How about this? You ask somebody to come over and do something. It's a definite maybe. <laughs> I've heard stuff like that. And I'm going, what? A definite maybe. How about this one? This is your only choice. Now think about that for a second. If it's your only choice, then there is no choice, right? You know, this is the one choice you have. Well, apparently not. Okay. If it's only, then then there's no. We say stuff like this, we don't get it, and then we say the same thing to God. I'm going to give you 50% commitment. You can't do it. You either commit to God your eternity or you don't. You either say, God, I'm totally committed on you. Because you know what? God values you. I want you to check this out. Because when we start thinking through this logically, you're valuable to Him. Uh, I'm way too logical. And you can ask my wife. Way too. She drives her crazy. Okay? I know that. My wife is crazy because everything's got to be logical. Anybody else out there like that? Okay, just... Okay, there's a couple. Okay, thank you. Thought I was abnormal. But, but can I tell you what God's asking from you to give you his, for you to give him your everything is a compliment to you. He thinks you're worth his time. He wants to use your life. The God of the universe says, listen, you're valuable to me. I want you to make a commitment to me so I can use you. This is the ultimate compliment God has given us. He says, I want you. I, I, I think you're valuable. 
I want to use you to change other people's eternity. Are you seeing how much God thinks of you when he asks to use your life? He wants your eternity. He wants your all so he can do something amazing with it. He thinks you're so valuable that he sent his son to die in your place so that you could live for him. Jesus made an incredible impact on this world, right? Well, we still talk about thousands thousand years later, 2,000 years later, we're still talking about Jesus. We still worship him. But here's the thing. He wants thousands and millions of people to follow him to take that message everywhere. He wants you to be one of his ambassadors to this world. But you can't do that if you don't give him your all, your everything. He wants to give you, he wants you to give him your everything. He wants to use it to change this world and to change somebody else's eternity. See, God wants you to commit your soul for his use to help others. He wants 100% commitment. Number three this morning, commit your mind to God. Go back to our our verse, Matthew 22, 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. How do we love God with our mind? What's included in the mind? Now, heart, I said, is where we make decisions, right? So what's our mind? When we talk about loving Him with your mind, He's talking about how you think. The value you put on things, right? Because I said earlier, your mind puts a value on things, orders things, and then your heart decides, right? So, when you think about this, your mind is where you put value on things, how you decide what's important. I don't know if you've chosen to be a follower of Jesus or not, but if you have, did your way of thinking change when you accepted Jesus? Things that weren't important before are. We're not brainwashed. It's more than that, actually. It's instantaneous. Now, not everything changes instantaneous, but as we commit our lives to Christ, the way we think changes. Instead of being selfish, we become selfless. We start using our, our, our lives for Jesus. Before you followed Jesus, you, you maybe you wanted to be rich. Right? Money was important. But now you want to invest your life in people. Money's not the important thing now. It's people. You, you, you are hoarding money, and now you feel this compulsion to give to missions to tell somebody else about Jesus. I, I, at their fellowship meeting this week, they announced, they do this every year at May Fellowship Meeting, it's one of the reasons I like to go, is our, church, our fellowship has about 800 missionaries, I don't know the exact number, it could be 600, 800, I don't know, whatever, whatever. But around the world this year, through all the missions, the, all our missionaries from our fellowship, that they had 120,000 people saved this year. Now, what if those 120,000 people go and win somebody else? But they, it's around 190, 120,000 every year. So in 10 years, we're winning over a million people. Our missionaries are winning over a million people to, to God around the world. I, I asked him, I said, hey, is there any way we could get that number broken down just with the missionaries we support? Because that would be a really cool number to hear, too. You know, that you support missions and... and 67,000 people got saved. I mean, you know, that'd be like a really cool number to hear. Like, you know, oh, it's worth it, you know. But when we follow Jesus, we start thinking that way. We start thinking, how can I invest my money to make sure other people know Jesus? Instead of saying, how can I hoard my money? You see, what he, he's calling us to change how we think based on what his word says. Where his word places value. You know what I said? Our brain decides orders, places value on tasks and everything like that, then our heart decides what we do, right? God's saying, I want you to quit using your brain to determine value and start using my word to determine value. I want you to start putting this as the priority in your life. He wants us to change to think his way. Think how he thinks. I, I want you to catch this, and this is very important in our lives. Age is not a gauge of maturity. Age is not a gauge of maturity. You can have old people that are really immature, and you can have very young people that are very mature. Age is not the gauge of maturity. But I think the first point in our lives where, maturity, where we realize maturity is when we have kids. Right? We have kids and we realize, I'm responsible to provide for their needs. Like when we have rice, we're taking this baby home, and I'm like, wait, 
if I don't provide, this baby's going to starve. If I don't provide clothes, this baby's not going to be clothed. If I, and we get kind of that God complex. You know what I'm saying? Like, I am everything to this child. <laughs> and we're not. Because God can provide in a host of ways. But that starts to mature us because hopefully we start saying, hey, I'm going to be less greedy. I'm going to sacrifice so I provide for my family. That's the first step of maturity. The second step of maturity is when we realize that we don't have all the answers. Some people never realize they don't have all the answers. Some people always think they have all the answers. I was there this week, and I talked to people both older and younger than I am and asked for advice. How do we grow our church better? And some of the things I'm doing are coming from people who have grown churches and seen these things work and pass them on to me. And I have to be mature enough to listen to people that are not me and say, hey, I don't have all the answers. Can I tell you, each and every one of us needs to be mature enough to understand we don't have all the answers and the only one that has all the answers is God. We don't. So if I know that I don't have all the answers, I know He does, I probably ought to know what He says to know what the answers are to my big questions. I need to know His Word. That's the second point of maturing when we realize, man, we don't have all the answers and I need to go somewhere to find the answers to life's toughest questions. And the answer to life's toughest question is right here in God's Word. This book is not a, a book of laws. It's a book of principles that we live our life by. Because if I break one of these laws, He doesn't kick me out. <coughs> he loves me anyway. He forgives me if I ask Him. He's committed that I have eternal life when I accept Him no matter what. It's not, a book of, it's not a book of laws that if I break them, if I break too many of them, I'm done. It's a book of principles that tells me how to think, how to guide my life. And when I start putting this into practice in my life, my life changes. And I start being committed to Him. Because I start changing the way I think to the way He thinks. Hopefully, you turn to God and ask Him for help. Often. Because it's often we don't have answers, if we're being honest. The only way we get help is by, by believing what He says and changing the way we think to match what He says. So I think my life will be better if I have lots of money. He says, you're wrong. He says, your life will be better if you'll sacrifice for me. And I go, I understand. A couple years ago, we had you guys, a lot of you guys make videos. Javi made a video about how giving does not make any sense whatsoever. And yet, God does something amazing when we start giving. He provides for our needs when we start tithing. Not because He needs money, but because He needs your heart, He needs your mind, He needs your soul. And when you start saying, hey, He has the answers, I don't. He says, tithe, I'm going to do it and just see what happens. God steps in and does some amazing things. Now, I am not a health and wealth pastor. I'm not saying if you have financial trouble, just give to God. Everything will be great. Because if you can't control your spending, you're in trouble. Plain and simple facts. But I'm saying this. You are going to be better off if you obey God and do what He says. And I believe tithing is taught throughout God's Word. Old Testament, New Testament, everywhere. You see, what we have to do is we have to start valuing His will over ours. We have to make Him the Lord of our life, not us. We have to say, God, what you say is more important. Your will is more important than mine. Giving God our mind means knowing that He is right every time and you're not. It's knowing that His will is best for us even when it doesn't make sense to us. It's placing value on His Word over your instincts. And that's tough. Your instincts say, do this, do this. And God says, I'm telling you what to do. And you have to choose between your instincts and God's Word. Hey, listen. If you want to give God your everything... You have to give Him your mind, which means you have to change how you think to say, this word's true, I'm going to follow it above my own instincts. I am not telling you things to do that are easy, okay? I get it. What I'm saying is not easy, but it's what God says. It's, it's how He calls us to live. The only way you do this, the only way you know what He thinks and what He says, is to study His Word, to understand His way of thinking, because it's different than ours. You have to study this word. Once you start studying this word, you realize that he thinks differently than we think. Our instincts are like wrong. Like, most of the time. You know? 
We say, hey, to have a good life, be rich. He says, to have a good life, give it away. Now, it, it, listen, I'm not saying you don't save for retirement. The Bible talks about planning for a future. You don't go to build a tower to, unless you count the cost and make sure. You need to know what, that you're going to have enough money for retirement. I am not against saving, okay? Don't, don't, don't take this wrong. I'm not against saving for your retirement. I save for my retirement. What I'm saying is we save for our retirement and we obey God and tithe and, and give tithes and offerings. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't make sense to us. I know. We've got to change the way we think. Go with His Word. See, God wants you to commit your mind to Him and think the way He thinks. Can I tell you something that I've heard? I'm about to step on anybody's toes that's in here. If you're easily offended, get ready. <laughs> I'm about to say something. I said this exact same thing in the other service. I'm about to say something that's going to make some people mad. So y'all ready to be mad this morning? Hey, at least we'll have a good fight, right? Mm -hmm. You'll talk about church. Man, this fight, church, pastors. <laughs> Here's what I want to tell you. I keep hearing this thing that that our church is separated because we have a traditional and contemporary. And we have two churches and, and, and we're not united. I, I'm about to give you the answer to that and you're not going to like it. If you're 100% committed to Him, you're going to be here tonight, which has both services in our evening service. If you think that we're not united because we're not meeting together, then here's your answer. Come tonight. Stop talking about we're not united because we don't meet together because we do every Sunday night. We meet together in life groups every week. In every life group that I know of, there's people from both the traditional and contemporary service. In every life group I know of. And they meet together. But what you're telling me is when we're not united means you're not taking part in everything. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, well, this church is united. Yeah, because you're not coming all the time. You come Sunday night, you come into a life group, you're going to meet people from both services. Right? I'm about, I'm about to get I'm about to get it. <laughs> Don't talk to me about not being united if you're not here all the time. I didn't think I'd get an amen, but I'm going to say it anyway. Don't talk to me about two different churches if you're not here all the time. I'm tired of people giving excuses because you know what that is? That's an excuse why you're upset. Because you know what? You're not thinking like God's thinking. You're not committing your mind to be here all the time. You say, I only want to give this, and when I'm there, I want this. That's not how God thinks. God says, not forsaking the assembly together is the manner of some is, but so much more as you see that day approach. Listen, the closer we get to God's return, the more we need to be together because it's going to get harder for us to live as Christians. And so can I tell you, you've got to change the way you think. If we're 100% committed to God, then we're here 100% of the time. I knew I wasn't going to get amen. Listen, I told him over there, I said the exact phrase, I'm just dumb enough to say what God says. I'm dumb enough to believe this word. And I'm dumb enough to tell you what I think because I love you. I'm not trying to tell you and put a guilt trip on you. I'm trying to tell you this. God wants your all. He wants all of you. He wants your heart. He wants your soul. And he wants your mind. To be 100% committed to Him. And we go to God and say, there's all this problem, God. And He says, it's because you're not committed to me. We give an excuse to God. Well, God, the church is united. Oh, yeah, it is. Every Sunday night we meet. We have both traditional, contemporary, and anybody else. Every life group has both traditional and contemporary. It's not about whether you're traditional or contemporary. It's about serving God about being committed to Now that I've made everybody mad, I want to wrap this up. You see, when we talk about this verse, Matthew 22, 37, and break it down into individual parts, we begin to see what God wants in our life. Listen to me. God wants commitment. God wants you to commit your heart to heavenly things. God wants you to commit your, your soul to for His use to help other people. And God wants you to commit your mind to Him and think the way He thinks. What's the greatest commandment, Jesus? 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. 100% commitment. What God's looking for is people who give 100% of themselves. I don't know if you're like that this morning. We don't make a difference giving 50%. We make a difference when we give 100%. I want, I want to develop passionate followers of Jesus who can give 100% to God. Because if I have people that are 100% committed to God, we're going to be world changers. This church is going to start changing people's eternity by winning people to Christ. We're going to rock this area. And I want to rock this area's world. I want them to say, what is going on at Cypress Creek Baptist Church? And I want the answer to be, they're 100% committed to God. They're giving Him His all. They're giving all of who they are to God. And He is rocking people's world. If you're committed out here in just a moment, we're having first invitation. I want you to come commit to Him. I want you to come down here and say, God, I'm 100% committed to following You. My, my heart, my soul, and my mind is Yours, God. Hey, listen, if you don't know Jesus, and you've never accepted Him as your Savior, you come to me. And I want to take God's word. We'll take as long as we need. And if anybody needs to leave, y'all leave. I'll, we'll leave people to Christ, okay? If you don't know Jesus, I want to show you in God's word how he says you can have a personal relationship. But it's giving him 100%. If you know him, are you giving him 100% now? Let's pray.